as we live life out in the world, a fallen world, does it ever feel to you like God turns a blind eye to evil? You watch the news, you see current events, or maybe things going on in your own life, and it feels like God stands by silently. And sometimes it seems like there's no consequences for sin. Looking at the world, it seems like many times justice is flipped on its head and the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. When you sin, you don't always see immediate consequences and you ask yourself, does it really matter how I live? Some have declared that God is dead and most in the world and even many self-proclaimed Christians act like it. Many live as if God doesn't exist, and sometimes it feels like they even prosper because of their wickedness. Have you ever prayed to God wondering how, if he is holy, so pure, and so righteous, how could he tolerate such evil? Feeling like he just idly sits by while the world rebels. This morning we're going to read from Habakkuk where the prophet was overwhelmed by this feeling of being in a sinful world among a sinful people where it felt like God was far off. And he prayed, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you won't hear? And God answered, and we're going to use that divine answer to guide our time of preparation for the Lord's Supper. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. And these men on the aisles will give you one. And if you don't own a Bible, please keep this one. If you simply forgot your Bible, feel, please feel free to use this one. But return it to the front or leave it at your seat when you're done. And turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. I hear lots of flipping. If you don't know where it is, it's at the end of the... Minor prophets, Uh, it'll go Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. If you find Matthew, go back five books and you'll be there. Before we read, I want to catch you up to what has happened at the point of 2 verse 4. Habakkuk wrote while living in the southern kingdom of Judah about a hundred years after Israel had been exiled. Uh, because of their unfaithfulness. But now in the southern kingdom, wickedness, idolatry, and lawlessness is rampant. And as Omri taught us a few years ago, Yahweh clearly said that he would not tolerate such wickedness among his people. Discipline would come, but it wasn't. So Habakkuk cries out in prayer, why would he allow such wickedness to surround him in Judah? And then in verse 5 of chapter 1, Yahweh says that he is going to actually raise up the Babylonians, a ruthless, greedy, powerful, godless, idol-worshipping nation to bring his promised discipline and punishment to Judah. But to Habakkuk, that solution seems even worse than the initial problem of lawlessness in Judah. Judah had sinned, sure, but Babylon was way worse. And seeing the suffering that would come, at the hand of Babylon, Habakkuk asks in 113, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up a man more righteous than he? Habakkuk cannot understand how God so- sovereignly, with his holiness, could use such wicked people to accomplish his purposes. So Habakkuk asks that question, and now chapter 2 starts while he waits for the answer. And God speaks. He commands Habakkuk to write the answer down so that all could understand. God says that soon, but not yet, at the appointed time, this vision will show how God will ultimately deal with the unrighteous and sustain his faithful. So now we're in Habakkuk 2, verse 4. He's speaking of the wicked ones, and he says, Behold, his soul is puffed up with like a cancerous pride and arrogance. It is not upright before him. 
And then from 2.5 on to the end of the chapter, God lays out the woes that will come. Don't worry, God goes on to say, judgment has already begun on the proud. They serve themselves, they live for their own pleasures. And even now, while they look like they prosper, they'll never be satisfied. And then at the appointed time, it's not here yet, but it's coming soon. God says that he will judge. And read with me in verse 16 of chapter 2 of what awaits the Babylonians and indeed all the unrighteous who have ever lived. The cup in Yahweh's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. At the appointed time, God's wrath will be poured out against all wicked. It might seem like God stands by idly, but he has a cup in his right hand of wrath. And it will be poured out against all of his enemies, all of the unrighteous ones. In a very short time, God's patience will not be able to be mistaken for idleness. The sin, the pleasure, the worldly gain that all of faithless humanity finds their glory in will be brought to shame. Perhaps you, some of you hearing my words now, will experience these woes. Some hearing my words now will have to drink the cup of God's righteous wrath that he is saving up for the appointed time. And do not mistake the Lord's slowness and patience for inability. But rather be thankful that that time has not yet come and you still have a chance, a chance right now to repent from your sins and turn in faith and escape that punishment and the woes that are contained here in Habakkuk and elsewhere throughout scripture. Finally, we get to the climax of the book, the single sentence of good news that reoriented Habakkuk's faith has motivated millions of faithful throughout the millennia, launched the Reformation, and will inform us this morning. 2.4b, he says, the righteous shall live by his faith. In contrast to the puffed up crooked heart ones, there is a group described as righteous whose life is characterized by faith. It's the unrighteous that will be judged, but there are some who will be counted righteous on that day, the ones who live by faith. These will escape the perfect, all-seeing judge's justice against the wicked, not because they haven't sinned, the five woes that God pronounces in chapter 2 won't apply to these righteous ones. They will not have to drink the cup of God's wrath because for them that cup is empty. God's son already drank it. More than a thousand years before Habakkuk, God saw Abraham's faith. The faith in God's promise. His trust in God's promise when God saw that, he counted it to Abraham as, righteous, as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. And the only ones who will survive the appointed time of God's judgments will be the ones who, like Abraham, have been declared righteous on the basis of faith. These are the ones who have lived life now during the time of God's patient endurance with sin by trusting in God and his promises even when those promises feel really far off. Habakkuk would need to live through years of Judah living in sin and then trust God through the brutal conquest of Judah and all the sufferings that we read about in Lamentations. You need to be sustained for life in this world as many days as God has for you. And the only way that Habakkuk would be sustained and the only way that you would be sustained would be to trust God. And on the basis of that trust and the life lived in that faith, God declares his own righteous. And then they would have hope when, when the God returns to judge. So even though it seems like God doesn't see sin, it seems like some are getting away with it, there is not a single sin ever committed that will not be judged with the full fury of God's righteous wrath. It will be borne either by the sinner or by Jesus, the sinless substitute on the cross. 
God could count Abraham, Habakkuk, you and me righteous on the basis of faith only because of Jesus. Jesus' righteousness becomes ours because our sins were placed on him. The bread we will eat and the juice we will drink are reminders of Jesus' body broken and blood spilt in our place. And just as Habakkuk 2.16 says, the cup of Yahweh's wrath in his right hand will come. The righteous are protected because Jesus drank down every drop from that cup that the faithful ones deserve. And as we live life, we are often tempted to be overwhelmed by the cares of today and the temptations of sin. But this time of the Lord's Supper of communion is a sweet means to sustain our faith. Reminders that Jesus is returning soon to judge and to save. So when you get the bread and juice in your hand, look forward to his return and look back to the cross where Jesus gave his body and blood so that we would have hope to stand on the basis of faith alone on that day when he returns. The perspective that we get at the Lord's Supper, finding ourselves between Jesus' cross and his return, sustains us in endurance to live a life of faith. It's our only hope to obtain the grace that declares us righteous before him. The men will be passing out bread and juice. These are symbols, reminders of Jesus for those who have faith in him. They don't do anything in and of themselves to save you but they are tangible, tasteable, touchable reminders to us of the object of our faith, our only hope for righteousness, Jesus. So if you don't have faith in Jesus, if you're not trusting in him alone to make you righteous before God, if you're not living a life of faith, let the bread and juice pass. But if you have faith in Jesus, take the bread and juice on your own as you're prepared in remembrance of him. If you're aware of sins in your life, agree with God that these are inconsistent with the life of faith to which you're called. Confess those sins, repent of them, and then take the bread and juice with joy, knowing that your righteousness is not based on your own works, but it's Jesus' righteousness imputed to you by grace through faith. Men, serve us, and then take communion as you're prepared.